All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Welcome. My name is Hade Gay, and I am currently the 2021-22 MU Series Coordinator. Um, and also, I'm a third year master's voice student here at the Shepherd School of Music. And I am so excited uh, to introduce to you this evening our highly esteemed guests. Uh, the Marion Anderson String Quartet. But before I do that, um, I want to tell you all a little bit about what Muse is about here at Rice. Um, the mission of Muse is to heighten the awareness and 
the, excuse me, heighten the awareness of underrepresented musical voices who have contributed to the tradition of Western art music and to equip the Shepherd community with the tools to address the issues specific to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Through our work, we hope to foster a healthy, safe, and proactive environment that is adaptable to the evolving field of music. One of the ways through which we carry out our goals are these discussions. We seek to glean from the rich perspectives of our esteemed guest artists to broaden our own community's perspective in the hope of cultivating a more holistic education here at Shepherd. Additionally, we desire that through these discussions, we might educate the Shepherd community on the reality concerning the ever-present barriers within the classical music industry, which marginalize various demographics of artists pertaining to identities such as, but not limited to, race, gender, and class. And therefore, to inspire a collective effort towards actionable steps which impact the Shepherd community as well as the industry at large. And now for our wonderful guests. Um, the Marion Anderson String Quartet is composed of Prudence McDaniel, Lisa Lawrence, Marion Henry, and Nicole Terry. On September 30th, 1989, the members of the Marion Anderson String Quartet, then, no then known as the Chaminade Quartet, came together, unaware that they would soon change history. In 1991, the quartet won the International Cleveland Quartet Competition, becoming the first African-American ensemble in history to win a classical music competition. To highlight this singular achievement, the members of the quartet asked permission of the great contralto, Marian Anderson, to use her name as their own. Miss Anderson responded with heartfelt approval, and in a memorable show of gratitude, the Marian Anderson String Quartet played for its legendary namesake and her nephew, conductor James DePrince. Since then, the Marian Anderson String Quartet has performed on main stages throughout the U.S. and abroad, including New York's Alice Tully Hall, the Corcoran Gallery, the Library of Congress, the Cleveland Institute of Music, Kilbourn Hall, the University of Southern California, the Chateau Contenac Brown in Bordeaux, France, and in 1993, they performed at Washington, D.C.'s Kennedy Center as part of the 52nd Presidential Inaugural Celebration. Over the years, the Marian Anderson String Quartet has received numerous awards, which include the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, Martin Luther King Memorial Award for Outstanding Artistic Achievement, and the prestigious Guarneri String Quartet Award from Chamber Music America that provided the funding for an extensive outreach, pro outreach project featuring the Marian Anderson String Quartet and benefiting the inner city school children of Seattle, Washington. Driven by their belief in the power of education, the Marian Anderson String Quartet has performed in hundreds of schools, churches, libraries, museums, soup kitchens, and prisons. Organizations hosting their residencies, concerts, and talks include the National Gallery of Art, Brown University, as the high mark inaugural artists in residence at the Center for the Study for Slavery and Justice, TEDx Blinn College, the Quad City Arts in Iowa, and University of Texas, San Antonio. Upcoming performances and residencies include their recital at the iconic 92nd Street Y in New York City on Friday, April 22nd, the historic performance with the Gateways Music Festival Orchestra at Carnegie Hall on Sunday, April 24th, and their residency hosted by Berklee College of Music, Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, in collaboration with the venues Hamilton Garrett Music and Arts in Roxbury and Bethel AME Church in Jamaica Plains. Um, please join me in welcoming these highly esteemed guests. Um, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Okay, may I be the first Anderson to say it is impossible to get through that opening slideshow without just crying. <laughs> Do you feel like just full to the brim? We look at all of this history and then I look at the panel and see a beautiful part of our collective and my individual history, my teacher James Dunham in the audience. And so I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, I'm just full, my cup is full and I'm so grateful, so grateful to be here. So proud of you, Deirdre, and the whole gang. <laughs> Welcome. I'll well, have you notarize that, please. And so <laughs> it will be in your inbox soon. <laughs> so, guys, did you see a lot of familiar faces in that slideshow? 
Oh, absolutely. Quite. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. We sure would not be here with, without them. Yeah. That's for sure. And so it's just, uh, yeah, it's hard not to us holding up. <laughs> the tears are behind my eyeballs. Yes. So. What was uncanny is how many of them we have, you know, you know, had uh, shared coffee with, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's so many of them that have mentored us and um, helped us move to the next level. And uh, so, so grateful for so many of them mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the beautiful part of that slide shows there's some people on there I didn't know. <laughs> right? And that's mm -hmm. the whole point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Tony Elliott's just playing the cello. Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Amazing. You yeah. created a big recital here in Texas where you and Tony performed together, yeah? Yes. Yes. Uh, when I first moved here um, to join you guys <laughs> at AM, I put together a cello octet. And Tony very graciously agreed to come and be a member of that octet. And it was, it was the very first time they'd had a cello octet here in, the, in, in College Station. And it was, it was wonderful and sad because the concert was right after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And so there were so many people who were valiantly out, uh, trying desperately to help people who had been unhomed and displaced. And so in my heart, I dedicated our performance yeah. to all of them. But it was a wonderful thing to be able to get eight of my cello friends from all over the country, including Tony, for that concert. Awesome. We had Mad Cello Envy on that day. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I certainly had C string and be for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wait, are there questions for us? Um, I just want to jump in because I want to uh, make sure we acknowledge the fishers are here. Yes. Oh my yes. Hi, guys. Hi. It's so nice to see you all. Hi, yeah. nice to see you too. Amazing. Yeah. Wow, this is like a family reunion. It really is, it really is. This is great. And, yeah. and I see one of, my, one of my students is on here, Jacob Pecora. Hi, Jacob. And hi, Anna. Hello there, glad to be here. <laughs> Looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes, right. Um, um, you know, I know we're going to get to this and how um, uh, mentors have inspired mentees and, you know, uh, what teachers have done for students. And I just want to talk about Norman for a second. I still remember a coaching in which you were getting us to, to make a phrase. And you said, uh, when you start at this note, the beginning of the phrase, already think that you're at the end of the phrase. What, what note is that at the end? And go to it. I still have that in my head and I still use that <laughs> for my students. And so you just never, you know, know what students, I mean, now I'm teaching, talking as a teacher, what students remember and how you've affected them. And so, you know, every time I say that to my students, I say, Norman Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet, thanks. I mean, we, it was so wonderful working with you guys and always such fantastic passion and great energy and and you're still out there doing these wonderful things we're so proud of everything that you, that you're doing and excited how you're making your own futures you know yeah. and your and your students you know what you're doing with that it's right. wonderful thank you thank you and and thank you um i'm lovey smith wright and I uh, will be asking some questions of the quartet. Uh, I am uh, one of the first alumni of the Shepherd School of Music. I'm a percussionist. And I started out playing Houston Ballet, Houston Grand Opera. Um, I was also president of the Houston Professional Musicians Association here in Houston for 18 years. And I retired from that. So 
I and I teach at the University of St. Thomas and I am the director, well no, the chair of the AFM Diversity Committee. So we're going to move forward. We um, have some questions we'd like to ask of the quartet and we'll start with, we'd like for you to just tell us the origin and story of the quartet. So whoever would like to do that, go for it. <laughs> Founder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we always have to share the story, right? <laughs> um, uh, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and um, um, I came up to study um, with um, Ariane Bronst Ariana Bronstein and Ralphio Bronstein at Manhattan School of Music. And um, oof, I was, I don't want to say sheltered. <laughs> But um, I guess you know didn't know a lot of didn't know a lot of things and uh, actually went out but my mom was scared for me you know was like don't take the subway and so forth and so forth and then I had to find friends you know and on the first day at Manhattan School of Music when I walked into the lobby I saw Deidre and she was sitting there and she looked like she knew what was going on so yes no, no I clue. introduced myself <laughs> no clue. <laughs> and so um, we became fast friends and cutting cutting the story down I ended up uh, living with her and her mother in the attic of their home her mother was so gracious uh, to me and only charged me what $95 a month for rent it was amazing to get rent at that time in New York City it was like you know $900 a month so. and so um, we became like best friends and we needed money, right? And um, so we started by playing on the street and in uh, Greenwich Village, um, I, there was a story in which we were both broke. I think we had a dollar fifty between the two of us and we went to a chicken place called Bojangles. <laughs> <laughs> and could you not, we, we, what did we get a two piece <laughs> dark meat yet? And, the and and that's what we had for dinner, you know? And we would meet friends knowing that we were all broke and we just trusted with that last token, you know, um, to meet at the corner of Christopher Street and West Forth, I think it was something like that. And that we were, you know, play lots of Einekline and Knock music, my double, string quartets and things like that. And um, we would always make enough money to last us for the next couple of days and you know, go back to school and then meet again the next weekend. Um, so let's see, um, we ended up, um, you know, once we were there, you know, for like a year or two, you would meet other people. <laughs> and Deirdre's mother would have um, these Christmas chamber music parties. And every time she would have them and we played chamber music, my thought was like, oh, I could do this for a living. I really could do this. And I remember finally stating that out loud in, in, in a Deirdre, she goes, I could do this too, I could do this. And so therefore um, we ended up uh, creating a um, Shaminat ensemble, right? And um, we got gigs around, you know, town, you know, we were still playing on the street. <laughs> and then eventually that evolved um, into uh, the Shaminat String Quartet. And at that point, we were auditioning for different festivals and so forth. And so um, we ended up going to France, American Conservatoire at Fontainebleau, and Bill Fitzpatrick was uh, the, um, the string teacher there, um, the chamber coach there. And uh, he encouraged us. He said, I think that you can you know, make it as a quartet. Um, we came back and we did have a personnel change. And um, at that point, we had a residency at Queens College, right? And um, for a little bit. And then um, we decided to um, audition for the Cleveland String Quartet. And that is a pretty funny story because my thought was like, um, I don't want to go all the way up to Rochester, New York to lose. <laughs> And because um, I don't, I didn't think we were gonna to win anything, you know. And um, so we actually did not go. And our cellist Michael Cameron at the time uh, came back and he says, "Well, they're coming to New York City. 
<laughs> and um, we can audition. And so, you know, we agreed to do that. And honestly, we, we, you know, my thought was like, well, what do we have to lose? Let's just go play. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what they saw was us and just being honest. Yes, Deirdre. <laughs> I'm in school. <laughs> I don't know if I ever shared with the other, you guys and other two folks in the quartet, what happened after we auditioned? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this, Mary, but we auditioned and we played, we played Mendelssohn 44-1, actually had a really great time. It was such a wonderful experience just to have the undivided attention of the Cleveland Quartet for uh -huh. the And then we went to see their concert afterwards. And I sat in the audience and they walked on stage, played the first chord, and all of a sudden I really wanted to win the Cleveland Quartet competition. <laughs> They started to play, I got so hungry and hoped and hoped and hoped. And they told us backstage that they had accepted us as the winners. And you would have thought we had just won the family feud. I mean, we were just all over the stage, blind back because we couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? Because we were, we needed that moment. And so I'm so happy that that moment found us right at the moment that we needed it. But I never ever told you guys that. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. And I'm so glad it wasn't on videotape. <laughs> well, what, what's fun for me is to, as many years as I've heard variations of the story, is to actually watch James Dunham listen to you tell the story. <laughs> and so uh, that's amazing for me to. Well, I wanted to just jump in and say, I was there. I remember that. And okay, I didn't video it, but it has never left my brain, by the way. And you guys were awesome. We loved your playing and we were so excited that we were able to say yes and that you were able to come and be with us up at Eastman. It was fantastic and great to have you here. Wow, that's that's a great, great story. I, I love it. So uh, maybe you could just tell us how the quartet has evolved over the years and what role, what is the role that mentorship has played in your development as artists? Who wants to take that? Oh, <laughs> well, I'll take the evolve question because um, you know I did, I wasn't part of that earlier. <laughs> How old were you, Marianne? What 10, 12 when this started? <laughs> um, so um, I've had the benefit of actually being on both sides. You know, uh, Marianne and Deirdre, the founders of this quartet, and. Um, you know, I, f when I was uh, years ago, I used to use the word stalker, you know, but I guess these days that's not so nice to say, but I kind of did stalk the quartet for a while you know, before I was in it. And uh, my brother lived in uh, Brooklyn at the time, uh, around the about 90s, in the early you know 90s or so. And so I was vid visiting him um, and um, actually went to school in New York, but this is prior to me going to school to, in New York. I was wa just walking down Flatbush Ave, and then all of a sudden I'm just walking and walking, I turn and see four black people on a poster with string instruments in their hand. I'm like, wait, what, where, what planet is this? <laughs> I was not sure. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that before. I mean, prior to a history book of some sort, but certainly not in my existence as a modern day. And so I tore that thing down, probably shouldn't have, because other people will probably want to go to the concert, but um, I tore that thing down and I was going to this concert that was going to be like the next day. And um, that was my um, introduction to who the Marian Anderson String Quartet uh, was was seeing this concert at a church, um, and they were so. I should always say that they know this. I always talk in this, you know, like I'm not in the group. But anyway, after 22 years, but anyway, so I um, I went to this concert and I met them, and I was just so inspired by that, and I knew that that was an awakening for me to, you know, one, you know, I can do this, uh, I can make this happen, and I think in some ways they encouraged me, the the quartet encouraged me to audition for major conservatories, which I didn't think. Uh, about doing before. And a few years later, I ended up at Juilliard and saw their New York debut uh, at Alice Tully Hall and then uh, crashed the party after. And, 
<laughs> Literally, I'm not lying. And um, so Anne sat at their table. James, were you at that table too? I think you must have been. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> that was something that Bob Freeman put together and it was such a thrill. Yes. Okay, so yeah. So you don't have memories of who's that other girl? Anyway, uh, so it was just a wonderful time to to um be inspired, motivated, but also make new friends um, in a field that in so many ways uh, can be isolating um, for a uh, woman, for black women in, in so many ways. So um, I was glad and then, um, but I came into the quartet uh, 10 years after that uh, long story and uh, ended up uh, starting my journey with the quartet here at Rice University. Um, and so it's been a wonderful, um, mostly that's, you know, my introduction into how I got into the quartet, but there's, I've stood by the mission before I was in it and uh, creating new and diverse, uh, audiences. And I stand by it today and I've worked really hard to try to just maintain that, uh, with the group. So I think, um, for me, and I want to pass the, the mic, of course, but I think I feel like we've become really clear about what that mission is for us and what outreach means and mm -hmm. the act of diversity. And so, I mean, we can all talk about that from our different van point, vantage points. And um, we haven't heard from our other founder and our cellist, Prudence, as well. So, Well, thank you, Nicole. Um, I met Marianne and Deidre when I went to Manhattan School of Music for my master's degree. And having been, from, growing up in Iowa, uh, the only black strength players that I ever saw were myself, my sister, and one other violinist from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And the only time we ever got to meet and be with each other or even say hello was every year at Allstate. And so out of a 250 piece orchestra for the four years that I attended Allstate in Iowa, we were the only three black string players in that, if from the entire state. So when I walked in the door my first day at Manhattan School of Music and on the sofa in the, in the lobby, which, which functioned as a student lounge as well, I saw these two beautiful women sitting on the sofa next to each other. And I identified immediately that they had violin cases. And I realized later that one of them was a larger case. So it was like, oh, violin and viola, yes! And <clears throat> we started to talk. So eventually, I was one of those people that was invited to come and play on the street with him. And just as Marianne's mother had been a kind of concerned <laughs> being a wide-eyed kid from Iowa, my mom made me promise I would never play on the streets of New York. <laughs> Little did she know, um, she found out about mm, 15 years after the fact <laughs> that I had indeed played on the streets of New York. <laughs> and that's where really solidified the, the friendship between us. And I was very grateful because that really helped me make ends meet. And I lived around the corner from Manhattan School at the International House. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, but I took a different route. I went the orchestral route. And so for 20 years before joining the quartet, I had an orchestral career. And when I began to be a bit tired of that, uh, I was making other plans. And then lo and behold, the phone rang literally in my hand as I was getting ready to make a phone call to change my life. My life was changed by hearing Nicole Cherry's voice on the other end of the phone, asking me if I would come and play with the Marian Anderson String Quartet. And it was one of the very best phone calls of my entire life. And uh, I wanted to take a moment and, it, and just address part of what this question was, which was mentorship, the importance of mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, 
I played in the Houston Symphony under the auspices of the Minority Orchestral Fellowship Program. And one of the people who was really influential in, in keeping me playing, actually, because my experience there wasn't the best, Anthony Elliott, the gentleman in the slideshow you heard playing that amazing piece by Coleridge Taylor Perkinson. Uh, he's the one who got me through. He's the one who inspired me to keep going. He is the one who made sure that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I could do this. And so I have to just speak from my own personal perspective that he inspired me to not just be a teacher, he inspired me to mentor all of my students to the very best of my ability because everyone needs to have that mentor. And it, I, I just factor it all in as being a part of each child's village. And I say, my, my, my private studio ranges in age from, um, at the moment, 13 to 60 something, mm. but it has gone as high as 80. And to me, all of my students are my babies. <laughs> so just being a part of that village and being a mentor to everyone who's there to learn and to experience and to delve and discover something deeper and more rich within themselves that they can share is really important to me. That's so beautiful, Fu. I love that story. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to you and you reminded me of a mentor story that I share with Mary Ann. Mary Ann, do you remember us walking down Broadway and we walked up to Symphony Space and we looked up and we saw Lou Rawls with the Harlem Festival Orchestra. And we were like, ooh, the Harlem Festival Orchestra. And so we snuck in, we didn't pay because we were so broke. So we snuck in and we looked at the concert and we looked on the stage and there was just this sea of black folk. <laughs> Everyone with a string instrument in their hand. And we were stunned and awed because besides each other, we had never seen anything like this. And so we went backstage to meet them. You know, we were very shy and shake hands. And I'm trying not to cry while I tell this story but collectively they got us through those hard years financially at Manhattan School of Music. They just reached out and wrapped their arms around us. And every time they had a Broadway show that needed a sub, we'd be the first call. Mm -hmm. Every time they were doing a performance, they would have a chair for us. And they made us feel like we were part of this world and it created a sense of safety and I think, I'm sure it's gonna come up in our conversation today, but I think one of the hardest things about being a person of color in this world is the safety net has holes in it. You know, it's hard to feel absolutely and supremely confident. And they stitched together all those little holes in the net for us so we could walk forward. And I really do believe the friendships that we started there were the foundation of what eventually became the quartet. We never actually sought out to create a black string quartet. We just wanted to collect our friends and make some music. And because of Harlem Festival Orchestra, quite a few of those friends were people of color. Mm -hmm. And so the composition of the quartet grew out of a very authentic environment, you know, and one that was extremely loving and healing and mentoring for us and for me personally at Manhattan School. Mm -hmm. Felix Farrar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Harlem Festival Orchestra, yes, absolutely. I still remember Gail Dixon, she's no longer with us, Akua Dixon's uh, sister. Uh, she was the one that got me into uh, Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm. And I can say this now that she snuck out a book and uh, I, I practiced the part. <laughs> and, you know, she was setting me up, she was setting me up to succeed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was able to get on that sub list. And um, also Meet Me in St. Louis did that um, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have had that experience, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's given me the confidence 
to be able to go forward. Right. And so very, very um, grateful. And as Deirdre said, we didn't set out to become an all black quartet. As a matter of fact, when Shaminat Ensemble started, we had a, a Caucasian pianist, right? Yep. And um, it just turned it turned into um, all strings because I just think it was easier <laughs> to 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 um, play on the street, if you will, you know, to do to do those things. And so, yeah. So I am certainly grateful. And also, you know, when I teach and when you know when the quartet teaches, we have all of that history behind us, you know, to um, to share. Um, probably will come up in another question, um, you know, um, when we're dealing with um, children, you know, and how we react to them. And, you know, I always take a, I'm always, I, I pause because I don't know what their background is. And so I can't be quick to rush to judgment mm -hmm. as to why they're giving me such and such an answer. You know, I have to, um, I have to think about it. I want to share this. Um, when we were at uh, when we were at Eastman, right, and we played for Paul Katz, and Paul Katz told us, he says, "You guys are a shame. You guys, you have shame." You know, mm. I, I, mm. Ugh, I don't want to cry. And um, you know, I was like, "Oh my God, he's reading us like, I mean, us me like a book," <laughs> you know. And they're just thinking of all the tribulation and um, people that have. Um, told me that I wasn't good enough to even go to New York, <laughs> you know? And so um, we had to, and I speak for myself, work through that. And that can affect you as a person. It uh, does affect you as a player, you know, to have the, to have the, that question mark whenever you play, you know? And it is, you know, it's taken years <laughs> to kind of, grow out of that but speaking of mentors nobody said this yet in our quartet but we mentor each other yes and you know um so we are there for each other and we pick each other up you know when we have these um um i don't know moments you know and so um i wanted to to share that i feel like now you know we are for I mean, I feel proud as a black woman and I am um, feel good, you know, about where I am, you know, and how we play, <laughs> you know, and that we are there to show other people that we can rise, rise up, <laughs> you know, and so anyway, but yeah. And I think that uh, I'll just add two seconds to that. I, I, I agree with you guys. You guys have moved me with your answers. I, I feel like um, from my point of view, like I grew up in the D.C. area. And so and um, Lynn McLean, who started the D.C. Youth Orchestra in 1969, that was his mission is to just grab the community, bring them together and play some music and play Beethoven symphonies and play uh, Hail Stark symphonies and whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. And so it doesn't matter, like Marianne is right on um, point with that, like at some point as a black person, as a black woman, you're going to run into that feeling of, oh, wait, I'm not accepted here for some, you know, like, you know, and so like it was kind of a flip side of the same coin because the majority of the DCYO, you know, African-American people, and he was commissioning black composers to do these things. And there was this wonderful impresario woman, Helen May, who was to, like all over the arts. And when I was really young, she took me to the Kennedy Center to see Todd Duncan. And I was like, who's that? You know, like, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, and now I look back and I said, wait, I saw Todd Duncan perform like two days before he passed. And so things like that occurred. And then, you know, you walk into adult life and you see all these different things shifting or you see from a different vantage point that oh wait this field is not full of me <laughs> so now how do i operate you know how do i work how do i maneuver and so the lesson comes at some point you know uh being an american person so um it is so important and, and uh to to create a mentoring circle you know and i think that that is one thing i learned so much about being in the group is that we have our mm -hmm. own circle as mentors and we co we collect them right we make sure that we we the uh 
the Cleveland Quartet and the Fishers and all the great people that have helped just keep us standing. Um, we maintain those relationships, but we also <laughs> make sure that we're saying, hey, you can do it, you can do it, and give people, uh, young people, a voice in which to uh, be themselves. Wow, this is this is great. I, I'm gonna gonna ask one more little question regarding the mentors. Uh, what suggestions do you have for both mentees and mentors to glean the most from their relationships? My my first in, my first natural response to that question is to maintain authenticity on both ends. You know, um, it's hard to build any trusting relationship if there's falseness present, you know? And if I'm going to mentor a person, I want to be completely truly who I am for them so they can see me transparently, you know? And then allow them opportunity by so doing to do the same. And then we can foster a, an atmosphere of trust out of which we can grow both as mentor and mentee. And so that's the first place that I would go. The second place I think I would invite them not to limit themselves to just having me as a mentor. You know, there's a world full of people that will influence this. I, my first impulse is to say child, but it could very well be an adult as Prudence speaks, you know. Um, I can only reach one aspect of that person, but a family, a village of mentors will help you get everything you need from whatever experience you're looking for. So that's my first place I would go with that question. I'm sure my colleagues are so brilliant that they've got more. I was just thinking you so beautifully said, Deidre. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sweetie. Um, I, I would music. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say I can feel the chamber music thing happen. I'm like, okay, who's going oh. to <laughs> 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 Okay, I'll, I'll step in then. Um, um, never be afraid to ask questions, right? And so as I was growing up, you know, um, I had many, I feel like many things in my head stopped me from asking questions because mm -hmm. I was just terrified to ask a question, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm always telling my students, ask questions. It doesn't matter um, how stupid you think the question is because there's no stupid questions. Right. Um, never um, don't have preconceived notions about the what the answer is going to be. You know, just go ahead and ask, ask the question. And it actually doesn't matter how old you are. Ask the question. The other thing is that um, never stop learning. Never stop um, asking questions or just, you know, tapping into people who inspire you. Um, keep learning. We are still learning. I'm still asking questions. I'm still tapping people that inspire me, you know, and um, in my quest to um, get to that perfect violin sound or string quartet sound in my head, <laughs> you know, and um, Pablo Casals can say, you know, he was 90 years old and he said, why do you still practice? And he said, because I think I can still get better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I have, we yeah. have no excuse, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so um, I am still asking. I am still, and I am just not ashamed. <laughs> I'm going to ask. And so. And on the heels of that, one of the most important things I have found is to both as a mentor and as a mentee to not limit yourself draw on everything you've got because you never ever ever know when what you know in one area is going to support uh, your ability to rise to the highest level in whatever your aim whatever your focus whatever your goal is that everything is interconnected so as Marianne said always ask questions and it doesn't matter about what. Always continue that learning process so that you are incredibly enriched on every level. And that goes to satisfying curiosity. Don't ever let your curiosity die. 
Great. All right. Well, moving on, uh, our next question for you. Were you ever pigeonholed or felt that there were certain expectations in the types of music you would perform or the types of venues you should access? Um, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the simple and most direct answer. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the most powerful moments I ever had was after I graduated from college from my bachelor's degree at Drake University. I had moved to Chicago and I was auditioning for the Chicago Civic Orchestra Summer Orchestra. And because their age range went up to 24 and I was 22. So I thought this would be a good way to uh, have a chance to meet some people my own age in, in the musical community, moving to a new city. And in the audition, one, uh, well, the man who was listening to me was a member of the Chicago Symphony Cello Section. And he said to me, you know, there are so few black cellists in the world and so few black female cellists in the world. But I must say you play surprisingly well. And coming from Des Moines, Iowa, where I was not used to not getting support from my teachers who incidentally were all white, I was stunned because the thought that rolled through my head was, oh my God, I've heard about this. What rock did you crawl out from under and who defossilized you? And then over time, I began to experience this type of thinking a little bit more and more. At the time, I didn't have a name for it. Today, we would call it bias. Uh, but initially, it, I just thought, well, these are just uneducated people. But ultimately, it, it did have an effect on my career. And it was insidious because it began to have an effect on my thinking. It did chip away self-confidence because until I, I went to Manhattan School and I had the chance to meet Deidre and to meet Marianne and to be a part of the Harlem Festival Orchestra. Thank you guys, by the way, for introducing me to that. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that there was that kind of support system available. And so have I ever been pigeonholed? Uh, yes. And I have to say that the pigeonholing didn't just come from the white community as I got older. The pigeonholing actually started in elementary school when my classmates who were Black did not think I should be pursuing this line of music as a Black person, that I was betraying my race. And so I actually got picked on for playing cello and playing classical music by the Black community. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not just one-sided. There are, there are many layers to this question and I will just pass it on to my colleagues because I'm sure that they have had interesting experiences with this too. I can really relate to a lot of what you're saying, Prudence, just as a child growing up. Um, I was never sort of mistreated because I played a string instrument or because I play classical music. I got beat up after school every day because I talk like a white girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that was the one. Um, and I didn't, and of course I would respond by exactly how does a white girl speak, which is enough to get me beaten for a second time. Yeah. And so 
professionally, I think I lucked out a little bit because I always had a little bit of a cocoon protecting me. Um, first, there was the Harlem Festival Orchestra, and then there was this quartet, you know? And so whatever ugliness there was, I kind of lived in this little imaginary bubble that we had created that kind of protected me from some of the less attractive experiences out there. I think if we've been pigeonholed musically, the answer would be yes, but it was done by design. We, we created the pigeonhole. We decided what categories of music we wanted to perform. We decided to celebrate um, African-American composers. And none of this was because we felt we were obligated to, but it actually grew out of a very authentic um, energy inside of the quartet. And so the pigeonhole is very comfy when you dig it yourself. <laughs> You know, and so I'm grateful now for where we are in our careers, having all matured as people and players and women. And we can take this, this idea that we created to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just wanted to jump in and... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, um, I just wanted to jump in and say, um, I, growing up, I don't think I was pigeonholed. And that concept didn't come until we formed the quartet and people would come up to us and say oh so you have a you're a string quartet are you going to play jazz so just assumed that we were going to play jazz and so it was always no 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 we're a classically trained string quartet and so i just found that um very in interesting and it happened more than on one you know occasion so i just wanted to throw that in did you guys ever have that experience where you're standing there? This actually happened in front of Manhattan School to me. I was standing there with my case, waiting for that bus that goes down Broadway so I could go have my, house, my lessons at my teacher's house. And I'm standing there in front of Manhattan School of Music with a gigantic, enormous viola case in front of me and a stranger will walk up and say, are you a singer? <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention, I was also smoking a cigarette because I was a chain smoker at the time. <laughs> What? Two equals what? You know, and so that happens. But then people are, you know, sometimes when your thinking is skewed, it's impossible to get an accurate perception of things. You know, so of course they looked at me and saw a singer because they can't see straight. <laughs> and luckily, knowing that means that it's not in any way my responsibility. And so it just made me laugh at this idiot person. <laughs> True story. I always found it really fascinating that I could be walking, I could have walked through that building with the child case on my shoulder for two years. And still the month before I was to graduate, I was asked by a faculty member if I was a singer and whose vocal studio I was a part of. And all I could do is say, yeah, no, sorry, my cello is my voice. <laughs> You really don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> voice. It is, it's a kind of insanity. Do you know? Right. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to one more question. Um, what was one important memory from a challenging period that helped your group continue to grow in your music? And who has been your biggest advocate and support at the most difficult times? I would say it's y'all. I'm just pointing at the screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would have to, yeah, definitely we help each other. Um, I will say, um, again, members of the Cleveland Quartet. <laughs> um, because when we were in California, and this is when we lost our second violinist, and we spoke with Paul Katz, cellist of the um, Cleveland Quartet. He was down at Rice and how we got to Rice. And he says, come on down, you know, basically we'll take care of you guys. <laughs> you know, you need a place where you could just uh, uh, recoup, right? And, and see, what's, see what's next. And uh, cause I mean, it could have just gone, it could have fallen apart at that point, you know but we just didn't want, we didn't want it to go away. <laughs> you know, and um, I couldn't see myself without the quartet. And um, I'm sure everybody else in the quartet felt the same way. And so we went down there, right? Three of us, 
you know, and then uh, uh, everybody there helped us uh, find our second violinist, right? And Blossom helped us, helped us blossom into what we are today, so yeah. And what a find. I mean, of all the people in the world to find, we found Nicole Cherry. Aww. Right. Yes. I mean, wow. Right. You know, a woman of power and vision and just a fantastic violinist. And mm -hmm. so that we were keeping the seat warm for you, sweetie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I can add to that. Uh, it's interesting that Marianne brought up, thank you so much. Um, feeling is mutual for sure, times three. So uh, I feel like um, Marianne brought up that that transition to this, the second violin and actually, um, you know, talk about crossroads, right? So a quartet leaves, uh, leaves, loses a member, but, you know, even on, you know, on my end, making the choice, a different career choice, right? Uh, at that time, I was in an orchestra. And so it was a question of like, you know, doesn't every uh, violinist or string player come out of the womb like, I wanna play chamber music, you know? like. <laughs> And so you're like, wait, I could do this, you know? So, and then don't forget, I was stalking them for like the last 15 years. So <laughs> it wasn't really a hard decision, but, um, but still there was questions and I'll never forget one night, it was about this hour and I was talking to Marianne on the phone and I can't remember everything, but I was like, oh, so what about this? And so what about that? And what happens if this? And she was answering questions so patiently as she does, you know? And I was like, but what about that? You know, and then, uh, and then she said, you know, it's going to be okay. Let's just go play quartets. <laughs> and I was just like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's music and we're just going to, you know, share it with people. And so, um, I came and I did the audition and, um, you know, they, the, the, I don't know if all quartet auditions are like this, but you know, when you have like, uh, members of the Cleveland quartet and. <laughs> Right, faculty as well, and then you know you think, okay, this is the real deal. I better do well. So, um, so, um, but it was a, a magical experience, and so, um, and so I just remember that moment, just you know, connecting with her. Didn't know her actually. Um, I did know her. I don't know if I ever told you this, Marianne, but in, in New York, when I was going to school and you were gigging around and everything, I would bump into you on the subway. And we would, there were times where I was sitting right across from you and you didn't know who I was, but you had your violin and you had that cute little Afro, right? Back oh. there, right? <laughs> you can't miss her, right? Little petite girl with the Afro, right? And I was like, oh, I wonder where she's going with her violin. So um, that was before we met, but I, I bumped into you about two times on the subway. So bizarre. <laughs> that is bizarre. You know, and so to have, to have the opportunity to talk to you on the phone uh, several years later, um, in a, like I said, you were just, a, it was a very um, advocating moment, a very supportive moment into like, okay, what are we really doing here? You know, you know, so and let's just get to it, you know? So that was very special for me. I never we, used have, we used to have a saying in the quartet, you know, it all goes crazy and we go, okay, let's just go down checklist. Up bow, down bow, it's a good day. <laughs> right. That's a good day. Okay, we're gonna, I wanna move on. I have a couple more questions and we're gonna move on to another segment. Um, were there any moments during, your, during the course of your careers when you considered stepping away because you had been marginalized for your identity. And how did you deal with that? And how did you persevere? Um, I have to say, honestly, that the answer for me is no. Um, I just, um, I, I've had moments in my life where I wondered if I should put the viola down. There was a patch of time talking about the hardship, you know, and my mother got very sick and then passed away. And I was, I made myself full-time responsible for her care. So I, we were kind of trapped in the house. She was bed bound. We were in hospice. It was the whole nine yards. And so literally maybe two years went by and I barely touched the instrument, you know, and I came out of that period and I just felt so raw and so broken. And I was afraid that at this age of my life, I wouldn't be able to recover some of the beautiful things I'd found at the instrument in my youth. And I wondered if maybe I should just let it go. And then I look up and I see these three amazing, beautiful women smiling at me, hungry for the next chapter. And it reminded me that I, I am not God. 
I cannot define what the future holds. I can only just bring my best in this moment. So I'll pick up the viola in this moment on this day and pick it up again and pick it up again until I can build myself not back to where I was, but to where I'm now going, which is a much bigger and better place than I left behind. And so um, any, I've never had a reason where I felt like an outside force had pushed me into putting the viol away or walking away from music. Maybe the force is strong, but the counter force of love is stronger. All right, anyone else? Okay, uh, yes? Oh, well, I'll add a little bit to that. I thought, oh, Mary, that looked like Marianne, you want to go? You guys have this thing. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I was just going to add, I agree wholeheartedly to uh, what uh, Deirdre was just saying. And I, I was thinking about that question, stepping away, stepping away from your passion, what your purpose is, what your calling is, that seems impossible, right? Mm -hmm. So I've never had that feeling because I think about um, these the, the issue of um, being marginalized as your identity. I was one, one day I was not two years ago, not too long ago, though, I was walking into a church, a friend of mine, um, was the music director there and I was just going to visit him and I was just walking down the hallway and a woman, nice woman came up to me and said, are you looking for AA? <laughs> and I was like, no. and I had my violin with me. I was no rehearsal, but I <laughs> so, it, so I say that to say that regardless of where I am, what I'm doing, these situations occur, right? So I might as well go steadfast into my calling and my purpose and then help others move through theirs, right? And, 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 and grow and be bigger, uh, uh, more and greater in their lives as well, so. Yes, and, and I wanna add to what Nicole was saying about stepping into your calling um, and your purpose, uh, one of the things that in the course of and the journey of my life, um, quite a few challenges have arisen, even in the last decade, uh, some pretty serious health things. And so there's, the, there's been the question, can I come back from this? Can I recover from it? And luckily the answer has been yes, but it's been a lot of, a lot of dedication, understanding exactly what my calling is, and also realizing that uh, you can know what your calling is and understand at the same time that there are multiple ways in which that calling can manifest. And so, um, in terms of, have I ever felt like I needed to step away because I was marginalized? Uh, yes, upon occasion, I have felt that, but I realized that the marginalization sometimes was internal because I wasn't fully accepting all that I am and all that I have to offer. So what Deidre was saying, about it being something that's internal. I think that's really important for people to realize uh, that one way of looking at your life and the marginalization is victimization. And the other way of looking at marginalization is looking at yourself realistically and acknowledging who you truly are and whether you're willing to be strong enough to go there. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, pretty, <laughs> I just I just need to add to this. Okay. Um, marginalized? No. Um, but I love what you said about you know uh, you marginalize yourself. So I know that, right? But the one thing that has um, kept me in this is the love of playing quartet. Is the love of playing with other people the love of playing something on a very high level, the love of hearing those harmonies and um, phrases and rhythms go together perfectly. <laughs> I, hate, I, mean, I hate to use the word perfectly, 
but when you've been playing with people for so long, they know where you go. Yeah. And you know, you know what I mean, right? And so mm-hmm. they um, it's just it's just a quality that I'm used to <laughs> that with these people. And so, you know, during the time of uh, Digger's mother, you know, and then Prudence's um, health scare, and we weren't really together, you know, and then the question arises as well, do we do this? You know, and I'm, you know, my thought was like, I hope so. You know, the prayer was please, because what we did together and the, the, the robust sound that we would that we were able to create as a quartet right um i couldn't see that going away i felt like that you know that's such a part of my life but the i keep coming back to this the 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 quality of music that we make together it's not even what i want to say it's just it's it's a it's it's a it's a love you know, of, of these harmonies and notes that we put together, you know, that's a uh, glue. I have no idea what I'm saying, but I'm sure you guys can get it. <laughs> I hear you. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just that, it's just the quality, you know, that, that, that keeps me going, keeps us all going, keeps me still at this stage of the game, trying to, to up my game on my instrument. Can I cry a little bit and remind you of a history moment that we share? Do you remember (laughs) we were backstage getting ready to do our Alice Tully debut and the first piece on the program was Hide and Joke. Mm -hmm. And then we did what we do in rehearsal. We took an E flat major scale and we harmonized it into four parts. And then we play the scale, descend the scale and I burst into tears. Mm-hmm. I could hear how much love there was reaching out across the quartet through those sounds. Mm-hmm. So I totally get what you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's hard to find that love just anywhere. Yeah. Wow. This is this has been great. <clears throat> I'm going to pass it um, on to Hadi. She's going to uh, take another segment. This has been just wonderful. You, thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I uh, feel yes, like I'm like the Oprah yeah. interview or something. I'm just crying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just echo um, Lovie. Thank you so much. I'm going to move on before I start bursting into tears. Uh, so <laughs> um, we will now be uh, transitioning into the serious <laughs> transitioning into the Q and A segment of tonight's discussion. Um, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, you can type them in the chat, um, or please, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, if you want to turn on your video, show us your wonderful face, um, and you know, ask away. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hi. Don't leave Hi. us open quiet, because we can talk, okay. <laughs> Can you guys see me? Yes. Uh, Sean here. Um, I had a question for all of you. Um, So I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was 2005 uh, was the year that I was accepted to be a part of the uh, Marian Anderson String Quartet Chamber Music Institute. And here I am, a, a, a second year college student, not knowing anything at all. And I came to the to this institute, and I'm surrounded by a ton of people that I didn't I didn't know a single one. And I'm like, oh, what is this this thing going to be? I, I had no idea uh, what this was going to be. And uh, I think we were at Bryan High, if I remember right. And yeah, and um, so we're everybody's out just being crazy kids running around talking to each other throwing food at each other something like that and (laughs) well i wasn't i was just watching this happening and (laughs) it wasn't too chaotic it was just fun fun chaos and then we were all being told that uh the concert is about to begin so we need to pile into the the auditorium or wherever it was 
Um, and so I go in there and I had not met any of the four of you other than talking to Nicole on the phone prior to this. And you all come out in your African garb outfits that just like blew my mind as you walked out on the stage. And then you sat down and you started to play and my jaw hit the floor. I was astounded by the fact that here are these four ladies who are playing like a machine that was built to, to work with itself so beautifully that there is nobody I could possibly imagine uh, be able to, to present this music in a better way than they did. Hmm. And so this was my most memorable performance that um, I got to witness of anybody, actually, not just your string quartet, but anybody ever. And I, my question follows now. My question was, was there a specific performance that you got to perform that was the most memorable to you? Who wants to go? Okay. I'll just go ahead and say it. You know it's coming, James. It was playing Mozart G minor quintet with you on the oh. stage. I, <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. I still I reference that to my students all the time. Do you know what I mean? Where the, the moment where you're in this and your teacher is next to you and they know everything about who you are as a player. And do you want to know what my second most significant moment was also a Cleveland Quartet moment? It was when we were on stage with you guys playing Mendelssohn Octet. Mm. And um, there's a beautiful moment at the end of the second movement that's kind of driven by second viola, right? And oh. you sometimes have that moment where your heart just gets full and like you're saying, man, all the shame and all the fear just disappears and then all of a sudden spirit is just playing for you. And I was blessed to have one of those moments. And I remember while this is happening, Bill Prusel pulled like a carry at the prom, just pivoted. So, and all of a sudden all this intensity from him is coming at me while he's climbing all over the sounds that I'm making. And then we got to the end of it and I'm a little sort of stunned and stoned by the experience. And I put my viola up to get ready for the next movement and you are sitting resolutely in rest position and you refuse to play a note until you make eye contact with me and go <laughs> yeah to this day that was one of the one of the greatest performing experiences of my life you are amazing thank you that's beautiful sorry i don't know where all that came from but this lecture <laughs> you guys <laughs> okay, I've got one. Um, it was it wasn't a performance; it was an audition, and it was a, a big audition for the Cleveland Cortex. <laughs> I have to keep going back to the Cleveland Cortex because we were just so raw and uh, had no expectations, and we just went in and played our little heart, hearts out, you know. And um, I don't know. I walked away from that going well they know who we are <laughs> you know <laughs> and um um and just going back when Deirdre said that story about after we did the quartet competition and then we went to the concert that was the same feeling after I heard the first note of the Cleveland Quartet play I was like oh my god I gotta do we gotta win this we gotta win this the whole concert <laughs> that's what I that's what I was thinking you know so um uh, yes, so that's my little addition to that. <laughs> you know, after almost 20 years of hearing these fantastic stories about all of the experiences and the, the sage advice and the great mentorship, it has been actually one of the... Uh, one of the regrets of my life that I didn't get to experience that with them. I didn't get to experience their work with the Cleveland String Quartet. But you should be very, very glad to know that they have passed on to me, boy, they rode me hard. 
Oh gosh, they broke me in. <laughs> they raised me up. And so everything that you gave to them, they passed on. I just wanted to share that with you. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, they have carried it forward and made it your own, which I love. Yes. And uh, uh, to answer to answer Sean, one of the most memorable performances was the first time I ever did play in a cello octet. Uh, my cello teacher at Drake University uh, had an opportunity. Uh, the local ballet company, the Des Moines uh, Civic Ballet, decided that they wanted to choreograph a piece to the Bacchianas Brasileiras. Mm -hmm number one, and that as I was a freshman in college and that performance was going to be in October. And we, so we had one month to learn the parts as students and put it together. And as you said, Marianne, and, and also Deidre, having that opportunity to play with your teacher is one of the most profound experiences. And so, it was, I, I played part eight, so I was on the bottom. And just, that was the first time I felt the full weight of the responsibility of baseline. Mm. And <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and then being on that stage in a semicircle, watching the dancers dance in front of us in real time most one of the most powerful performances of my life mm. well I if i would just add my two cents it's so beautiful uh you three in your uh your uh most compelling concerts like that i, I actually i can't get it out my out of my mind is that one time we played in the max maximum security prison in houston yeah, was, uh, it was um it was kind of mind blowing and life changing to, um, because you you know we we talk a lot about what um, music can do for people and how it can be, you know be a sense of recovery and healing and when you see it viscerally in front of you you know and I know it's not me making that happen it is the experience of these sounds just happening in the room and I'll just never forget it you know these what was it like twenty um prisoners um at the time and you know what we're playing Dvorak American and every time we hit a high note they were like wow you know like <laughs> yes thank you you know and I'm like wow man I don't need to play jazz after all you know? <laughs> that was you know and so that was the that was one of the talk about you know I, I don't know what that did for them I could tell but you know it did so much for me you know it it, it really help me understand how powerful, to use Prudence's word, music can be. Um, just, you know, just the four of us playing it together as Marianne's suggesting, but the gift of giving it to others um, in all forms, in all platforms, in all spaces uh, is just an, is an amazing thing. And I'm, of course I'm preaching to the choir in this room, but <laughs> Uh, literally, right? Or yeah. <laughs> preaching to the string quartet, I guess. But, um, you know, so that was just, I can't, every time somebody asks a variation on that question, that just pops right into my mind. Do you remember at the end where one by one they all stood up and like expressed their gratitude? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll be orange because they're all in there for like murder or something. Intent. You know, it was, and or they'd stand up and say, I played violin when I was in high school. You know, <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I have to uh, say that uh, the other really amazing performance that comes to mind was when we were in Silver Spring, Maryland, playing at a school for students where that was their last chance. They'd mm -hmm. been kicked out of school so many times for behavioral issues. And they brought maybe 25 kids into the room. And we were playing and doing our outreach performance. And we usually like to have a, a, at least one kid come up on stage and sit in with the quartet, 
call one of us, hands the instrument to them, and then we step away. And so we asked who wanted to come up and, and play. And this girl raised her hand and she came up and said she had played cello. And so I stepped aside, sat her down and had her plucking the open strings while, while my quartet played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star with her. And she just was talking up a storm and having a great time. And afterwards, her teacher came up to me and said, that is the most any of us have heard her say in the last three months. She doesn't talk. Mm. And that was when, and, and I had just joined the quartet at that point. And that was what really brought home to me the power and importance of our mission. It isn't, it isn't just the, it's, it is creating new and diverse audiences, but it really brought home the power, the healing power of what we do for our audience mm -hmm. and for really the world community. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna jump in. Um, we were at a nursing home and we played and there was a woman who was there, who said that she played violin, right? <laughs> and she was talking. And um, at, the end of the, at, the, at the end of the show, um, the nurse came up to us and said that she is, uh, has uh, Alzheimer's and that she uh, indeed was a violinist. And it was the first time that she had spoken in months and she was speaking coherently. And so, yes, <laughs> it's amazing what music does, you know, and so we should all be doing it. <laughs> I think this that is should be a part of what we do. I think it's something that makes me so part of my cough. I we told you guys I have ter terrible allergies. Um, I think it's something that makes me so proud to be a member of this quartet because we were playing in the maximum security prisons and the nursing homes and the school for children who are on their last leg, kind of before it became popular, you know? And so I feel like it's one thing to be an African-American ensemble. I'm so proud of that as well, but to be an ensemble that started this movement of outreach is I think I'm equally proud of that. Mm -hmm. And now of course it's, it's a common expected thing with a string quartet or an orchestra that you're going to be reaching out into the community to try to break down this, this odd thing between us and our audiences, you know? Because in truth, I respond the same way the folks in the prison do. You hit a high note and I go, I fall out. Mm -hmm. You know, we all feel that way. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason why there should be some random little walls that separate us. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very proud of who we've become. I'm very proud and excited of who we're continuing to become. And I'm so grateful for the fact that this journey is not over. It's just this can continue. You know, I'm telling another random story. Way back, Marianne, you're in all of my way back stories. You know this, right? Are you noticing this? <clears throat> At the very, very beginning, when we were still the you know, piano quartet, we um, played, I think it was like one of the Mozart piano quartets for Arthur Balsam. Remember that, Arthur Balsam? And he was so excited. He was so old, but still played the piano so beautifully. And he jumps onto the piano at the end of our coaching. And he's like, I love the piano quartet literature. You can play this, and you can play this, and you can play this. He's like, I'm 90, I don't have the strength that I used to, but my, my hands still move really fast. And he's just playing and playing and playing. And then he says, the thing he loves the most about music is he's 90 something years old and he's still not done yet. Hmm. And in some ways that kind of sort of sat in my heart, talking about the mentor question, sat in my heart and sat in my spirit. And that is the same thing that pulls me, this feeling that there is no finish line. It's just perpetual evolution. And I feel that way as a member of this quartet, that there is perpetual evolution here. And I'm grateful to be in that flow. We go way back, Marianne. Are you aware? <laughs> we got history. I think you, uh, you should write a book. <laughs> this is a book. Write a book. Down. 
Do you remember? Uh, okay, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marianne, Marianne and I go way back because when we were at Manhattan School, we were well, we doing were piano trios together, right. Right. <laughs> rehearsing and coaching, and right with Mark yeah. Silverman. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Sean, um, for that question. Oh yeah. Thank you, Sean. Um, yes. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we have time for one, maybe two, but most likely one question, um, if anyone would like to ask. Don't give us open mic. We'll just keep talking. <laughs> Give me a chance to tell Sean how proud we are of him. That's right. Oh, yeah. yes. You came, when we first met you, you were just this lost old kid. And now I'm looking and there's an invitation to your wedding in the mail. It's just, you just grew into a man of power and purpose. And we are ever impressed and ever proud of you. Yes, and all of the work that you did at the elementary school and you really <laughs> talk about mentorship. It was so incredible to see you passing on everything that you've learned. And, and the way you mentored your students was just so beautiful to behold. Ah. Have, all, have you all done any collaborations with Sweet Honey and The Rock? Matter of fact, <laughs> um, Sweet Honey and Rock, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> African-American woman a cappella group um, founded by Dr. Bernice Regan in Washington, D.C. Um, happened to be from that area, and I have been a fan for a very long time. So it wasn't that long ago, um, having met a couple of the members throughout the years, that when we started our um, Continuing the Legacy Project, uh, which is a, basically a dedication to Marian Anderson's contribution to the musical world. We wanted to reimagine the, the Negro spiritual uh, through the ensemble of the string quartet on the concert stage. And so we uh, requested commissions from various composers, still are, uh, to do this, um, do this wonderful project justice. And Isai Barnwell, who plays, uh, who's singing the, she's retired now for three years, I think, uh, from the group, but she, we asked her, requested her to write a few spirituals uh, from her point of view for the um, quartet, uh, who Isai Barno was the lowest voice of Sweet Honey for the longest time. And uh, so uh, that actually uh, started and is still in progress, but uh, we are still in uh, communication with her. Um, and um, she actually is a violinist too. You know, so uh, she does understand string language and also her, you know, her father was an avid string um, enthusiast and named her Izai after the great violinist <laughs> Eugene Izai. So I was like, okay, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice uh, con connection right there. So that is a, such an amazing question there, Trey. So thank you. <laughs> it's like you were reading my mind, like who can talk about one of Nicole Cherry's favorite groups? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, Trey said yay. I also echo that. I love their beatitudes. It just mm -hmm. gets me every single time. Um, um, I think that is actually all the time that we have for uh, this evening. Um, thank you so, 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 so much again, um, just for gracing us with your time and energy. Personally, my heart is so full and I know I'm not alone. Um, and thank you everyone for attending this evening's discussion. Thank you. Um, please be on the lookout for our next new series event, which will take place on Tuesday, April 5th at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, where we will be joined by soprano Julia Bullock and composer Anthony Davis. Um, everyone, please have a great night and take care of yourselves. Thank you.